In contrast to hematology, which is the study of blood-based disorders, including the hematologic malignancies like leukemia and lymphoma, in the oncology section, we will be covering the solid tumors. The cancer types that are most commonly tested on the USMLE Step 2 include breast, prostate, lung, ovarian, testicular, and cervical cancer. We'll begin our discussion with breast cancer. In this section, we'll cover how the test makers may describe a woman presenting with breast cancer, the diagnostic workup, including special genetic markers such as BRCA1 and 2, as well as treatment options for patients with breast cancer. Most breast cancer is detected when a woman herself notices a lump or mass in her own breast. However, with the increase in the prevalence of screening mammography, more and more asymptomatic women are diagnosed with early stage, small breast cancers, which is a good thing. Less commonly, a medical practitioner can sometimes detect a mass on physical exam. Although the recommendations regarding routine self-breast exams and physician breast exams are controversial, so they'll probably not be tested on the USMLE Step 2. What you should know is how test makers will describe the case presentation when they want you to know breast cancer is the diagnosis. Keywords they may throw into the clinical vignette when they're describing a malignant breast mass include a firm or a hard texture, fixed or immobile feeling on palpation, or in more advanced tumors, fixation of the mass to the chest wall itself. Breast cancer can present with several manifestations. Most often it presents as a palpable lump, but can also cause skin changes like dimpling or changes in the color or texture of the skin. It can cause nipple retraction if the tumor involves the ligaments within the breast and can also cause nipple discharge. If the nipple discharge is bloody, that's classically associated with something called intraductal papilloma, but bloody nipple discharge can be seen with any tumor that invades the ductal system. Here are some illustrations to help you remember the changes associated with breast cancer. Now an important thing to remember is that masses due to breast cancer are typically painless. This distinguishes them from things like fibrocystic disease of the breast, which presents as multiple, painful, round, and mobile breast lesions. Breast abscesses are often also described as very painful to palpation. So now that you know the classic clinical presentation describing when to suspect breast cancer, how do we go about diagnosing it? The best initial test for breast cancer, once a mass is identified, is to biopsy it. So whether the mass is found by palpation, ultrasound, or mammogram, it's important to actually obtain cells from microscopic examination. There are many ways to obtain cells for biopsy. From least to most invasive, the three ways we can obtain a biopsy include fine needle aspiration, or FNA, core needle biopsy, an open or surgical biopsy. Now FNA is the best initial biopsy because it's the least invasive. This test has a really small false positive rate, only about 2%, but since it only samples a small amount of tumor cells, the false negative rate is as high as 10%. Corneal biopsy is one step in the more invasive direction, and it has several distinct advantages over FNA. First, it gives you more tissue, and second, it allows for the detection of estrogen and progesterone receptors, as well as the presence of the HER2 or NU receptor. These receptors, as we'll talk about a little bit later, are really important for prognosis and for choosing the right treatment. However, the need for a larger needle for this core needle biopsy means that it can be more deforming as it removes more tissue from the breast itself. Also, there is a small chance of seeding the needle tract as you put the needle in and uh, pull it out from the body, seeding that needle tract with tumor cells. Now, if the question asks you for the most accurate diagnostic test for breast cancer, the correct answer is going to be an open or surgical biopsy. This is obviously most accurate because it obtains the most amount of tissue, and with all diagnosis of cancer, more is better in terms of tissue. With this type of biopsy, the patient is actually taken to the OR and put under general anesthesia, and the biopsy tissue is sent to the pathology lab to look at it with frozen section while the patient is still under anesthesia. When the results come back, the pathologist tells the surgeon whether or not cancer cells are present, and if cancer cells are there, the 
tumor resection is done right then and there under the same general anesthesia. Recommendations regarding screening mammography have recently become a source of controversy that you may have heard about or read about in the media. The confusing thing for both medical professionals and for patients themselves is that there are two major medical organizations that have made conflicting recommendations regarding when to start screening, when to stop screening, and how often the screening should be performed. The American Cancer Society recommends that screening mammograms start at age 40 and continue yearly. However, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force came out with recommendations recently that mammograms should start at age 50 and then should be repeated every two years until a woman reaches the age of 74, after which mammograms can be discontinued altogether. So what do you need to know? The bottom line is, on the USMLE Step 2, the correct answer for when a healthy woman should begin to have routine mammograms is at age 50. The caveat is, if a woman younger than 50 has a strong family history or otherwise desires to begin screening earlier, that can be discussed between the physician and the patient on a case-by-case -case basis. Next, let's apply what we've learned so far to a clinical vignette. We've got a woman who finds a hard, non-tender breast mass on self-examination. So far, it sounds like breast cancer. There's no alteration of the mass with menstruation, which makes something like fibrocystic change of the breast less common. She's scheduled to undergo an FNA biopsy, which we've said is the best initial biopsy of choice. So the question here, which of the following is most likely to benefit the patient? Our answer choices are mammography, BRCA testing, ultrasound, bone scan, and PET scan. So looking through this case presentation, the case presentation is typical for breast cancer, and she's already scheduled to undergo the test of choice. So which of these might also benefit her? The correct answer is A, mammography. So you might be asking yourself, if we're already going to do a biopsy, what's the point in doing a mammogram? We already know that there's a mass there. The reason a mammogram might benefit this woman is that 5 to 10 percent of women with one breast mass also have bilateral disease in the contralateral breast. This is important to know because there's a huge difference in the management of breast cancer, whether there's a single lesion, lesion in both breasts, or even multiple lesions in the same breast. So all of this information is important to know before treatment is planned. And now that we know the right answer, let's take a look at the other answer choices and discuss briefly why they're wrong. BRCA testing is not the right answer because although we know that people with a positive BRCA mutation are at increased risk for cancer, it doesn't really give us any additional information on how best to treat them. We'll talk a little bit more about this controversy later. Ultrasound is not really an important test once we know a mass is suspicious for cancer because it only tells us whether the mass is cystic or solid. Here, the physical exam gave us all the information we needed to know. The mass was hard and non-tender on self-examination. Now, a bone scan really just gives us information on whether or not there are metastasis present in the bones. And PET scan, similarly, it just tells us whether there may be suspicious lesions in lymph nodes or other parts of the body suspicious for cancer. We mentioned ultrasound is one of the wrong answers to our previous question, so when is ultrasound the right answer? Ultrasound is the most useful when a mass is felt by either the patient or the physician, and it's not exactly clear by the physical exam whether the mass is cystic or solid. Ultrasound is sometimes a better test in young women because young women have more dense glandular tissue in their breast, and that makes mammograms a little bit less reliable. But on the whole, you should choose ultrasound as the best first test if the question stem gives you every reason in the world to think this woman does not have cancer, and perhaps she has indeed instead a fibrocystic breast condition. Typically, the women will be young, in their 20s, the mass will be painful, and they'll get larger and smaller, the pain will get better and worse at various times in her menstrual cycle. We also saw PET scan as an answer choice in our last clinical vignette. 
A PET scan is a nuclear medicine study, and it uses tagged glucose and takes special pictures to show where it accumulates in the body. Cancer cells grow much, much faster than normal cells, and to grow that much faster, they need to take up more glucose. Therefore, they take up more of this tagged glucose, and that's what makes them light up on the PET scan. Now remember, a PET scan is far from a perfect test, because things like infection also cause increased glucose uptake. It's also a common misconception that if something is positive on a PET scan, you don't have to biopsy it. That's not the case. Biopsy is still the very best test for diagnosing cancer, and most oncologists won't even treat a patient unless their cancer is proven by biopsy. So when is PET scan the right answer? PET scan is the right answer on the USMLE Step 2 if you have an enlarged or abnormal looking lymph node or other mass that's somewhere in the body where you cannot easily obtain a biopsy. You can also use PET scan to follow or look for recurrence in a cancer you've already proven with biopsy. Let's take this case as an example. Here we have an 80 year old woman with biopsy proven breast cancer. She has no nodes with cancer in the axilla and the primary lesion is small. Therefore, the woman may not need adjuvant chemotherapy, which we'll talk more about later. She has a chest CT that shows an abnormal hyalur lymph node. In this case, a PET scan may be useful because it can exclude the abnormal hyalur lymph node as a metastasis. Therefore, if the PET scan is negative, she may not need additional chemotherapy. But if the PET scan is positive, the doctor may go ahead and treat her with adjuvant chemotherapy. Genetic and molecular medicine and the assessment of cancer risk is a really hot topic right now in research. As is the case with most controversial topics, the USMLE Step 2 question writers tend to shy away from questions about the exact meaning of BRCA test results, unless the findings are really straightforward. So here's what we know for sure. BRCA mutations can be inherited and tend to run in families. They definitely increase your risk of breast cancer, and in a woman who presents with breast or ovarian cancer at a young age, she may have a BRCA mutation. What's not clear is what to do with those test results. And because it's controversial, the USMLE Step 2 will not, for example, ask you who should or should not receive a test for the BRCA mutation or how the treatment should be altered, whether or not BRCA is positive. Another area of controversy is the breast MRI. So some physicians find it useful in certain populations, but since its benefit has not been proven, it will not likely be the correct answer for any USMLE Step 2 question. Years ago, all breast cancer was treated with mastectomy and their removal of all the axillary lymph nodes. That's because breast cancer first spreads to lymph nodes under the arm. Now, breast cancer can be removed either with a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, more about that later, but all the lymph nodes are not always removed in all patients. This is because we've found removing all of the axillary lymph nodes can cause really severe side effects and problems down the road, mainly lymphedema, which is the painful swelling of the arm that's on the same side as surgery. Instead, what we typically do to examine the lymph nodes in a patient with breast cancer is at the time of lumpectomy or mastectomy, we do something called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. We do this because we want to know the risk that the breast cancer has spread to the lymph nodes under the arms. So the sentinel lymph node is the place that receives the lymphatic drainage from the place where the cancer is in the breast. It's identified by injecting contrast or a special dye into the tumor or the tumor bed, and it lights up the first lymph node that drains lymphatic flow from that area. So the, the lymph node that lights up first is called the sentinel lymph node. It's usually surgically removed at the time of lumpectomy or mastectomy, and it's checked under the microscope for cancer. If the sentinel lymph node is negative, it's really unlikely that any other lymph nodes or places elsewhere in the body will have cancer, so in those cases, a total lymph node dissection is not done. If the sentinel lymph node is positive, meaning that cancer is spread from the area in the breast to that one lymph node under the arm, additional lymph nodes from the axilla will be taken and sampled, to determine how much lymphatic spread is present. Breast cancer cells can have several hormonal receptors on their surface. They can have estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, 
or they can have receptors for their human epidermal growth factor 2, which is known as HER2, or new receptor. The receptor status of breast cancer cells is really important to know because it helps give information about prognosis. You may have heard of the triple negative breast cancer, that's negative for ER, PR, and HER2 nu, has the worst prognosis. But receptor status also gives you information about additional therapies that may be beneficial in treating breast cancer. We'll talk more about these, the estrogen receptor antagonists like tamoxifen or raloxifene. There are three main surgical options for removing breast cancer. Lumpectomy is just what it sounds like. It's where you surgically remove just the tumor and spare as much of the normal breast tissue and skin and muscle as possible. It usually gives the best cosmetic outcomes, especially if the tumor itself is small. The modified radical mastectomy is a little bit more radical. It involves removal of all the breast tissue as well as lymph nodes under the arm. The radical mastectomy is the most radical surgery and it involves removal of all the breast tissue as well as the skin above the breast tissue and the muscles beneath the breast tissue, the pectoralis muscles. Also in a radical mastectomy, all of the lymph nodes are removed. It's important to know that because a radical mastectomy has never been proven to be more beneficial or have a better survival than the less invasive surgeries, it will always be the wrong answer on USMLE Step 2. And that makes sense. Why would you do such a radical surgery that removes more skin and muscle from the body if it doesn't give any benefit to the patient? The other thing to remember about these surgical options is that a lumpectomy followed by radiation therapy gives just as good an outcome as a modified radical mastectomy. So in this case, for early stage breast cancer, the treatment option is really left up to the patient. If the patient would rather spare as much breast tissue as possible, she can have a lumpectomy followed by radiation. Or if she'd rather just have the whole breast removed and not have to undergo radiation, she can have a modified radical mastectomy. It's just important to know for the test and for counseling patients in the future that both will have the same results in terms of risk of cancer recurrence as well as the chances of dying from breast cancer. After surgery and possibly radiation therapy, women who have estrogen or progesterone receptor positive cancer should receive hormonal therapy. People who have ER or PR positive breast cancer have a better survival and less recurrence if they take one of these hormonal treatments. Tamoxifen is an estrogen antagonist that acts as an antagonist in the breast and an agonist in the endometrium. So it's important to remember about tamoxifen that women who have not yet had a hysterectomy have an increased risk of uterine or endometrial cancer. Raloxifene has a benefit that it is an antagonist both in the breast and in the endometrium, so it has much less risk of increasing chances for uterine cancer. The aromatase inhibitors work by blocking the production of estrogen, and studies have actually shown that aromatase inhibitors work better than either tamoxifen or raloxifene. So, if all of these are present as answer choices, you should choose one of the aromatase inhibitors. It's going to be most likely to benefit the patient. It's important to keep in mind the key differences in the side effects of these oral hormonal therapies, so let's review them here. It's important to remember that tamoxifen increases the risk of both endometrial cancer and blood clots. That's because tamoxifen acts as an agonist in the endometrium and an antagonist in breast tissue. Raloxifene increases the risk of blood clots, but it has much less risk of endometrial cancer because it acts as an antagonist in the endometrium. Aromatase inhibitors increase the risk for osteoporosis because they block the effects of estrogen everywhere in the body, including their beneficial effects of estrogen in the bone density. You may have heard of this monoclonal antibody medication called trastuzumab. So when is trastuzumab the right answer on test day? It is a monoclonal antibody that is made against the HER2 nu receptor. So all breast cancers should be tested for the HER2 nu receptor and trastuzumab should be given if HER2 nu is positive. Its main benefit is that it decreases the risk of breast cancer recurrence after surgery. 
Not all women with breast cancer need chemotherapy, but when chemotherapy is given, it's either given before or after the definitive treatment, which in the case of breast cancer is surgery. Neoadjuvant means that the therapy is given before definitive treatment, and adjuvant means that chemotherapy is given after the definitive treatment. The goal of neoadjuvant chemo is to reduce the amount of cancer in the body and to make the surgery more likely to be successful, whereas adjuvant chemotherapy is given to kill any cancer cells that may have been left behind after surgery or may have spread to other parts of the body before the surgery was performed, but that are too small to be detected by imaging or other diagnostic tools. Indications for adjuvant chemotherapy after breast cancer surgery and maybe radiation include tumors that are big, that are larger than one centimeter, or the presence of cancer in the axillary lymph nodes. It's important to remember that in addition to being useful as an adjuvant hormonal agent, tamoxifen has been shown to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. So it's sometimes given to women who don't have breast cancer, but have multiple first degree relatives with the disease. Again, the BRCA mutation is a source of controversy. We know a positive mutation increases a person's risk for cancer, both breast and ovarian, but we don't yet know exactly what to do with that information in terms of either prevention or treatment. What does that mean to you? It's unlikely to be a source of questions on your USMLE Step 2. To wrap up this section, let's review some things that have been definitely shown to lower mortality in breast cancer. That means they're likely sources of questions on the USMLE Step 2. Mammograms pick up smaller, earlier stage cancer, so they improve mortality by detecting the cancers when they're more likely to be treated to a total cure. All tumors should be tested for estrogen and progesterone receptors, and if it's appropriate, should be followed by the use of hormonal therapy. Remember that aromatase inhibitors have better effects than tamoxifen or raloxifene, so if all of them are correct answers, choose aromatase inhibitors. Adjuvant chemotherapy improves survival if the tumor is large, greater than one centimeter, or if lymph nodes are positive. And remember that lumpectomy plus radiation has equal survival to a modified radical mastectomy, so it should be left up to patient preference. Trastuzumab can improve mortality if the patient is positive for the HER2 nu receptor. And in a patient with many first degree relatives with breast cancer, we can improve mortality, we can prevent breast cancer by doing prophylactic tamoxifen. And this concludes our section on breast cancer. We will discuss the key details regarding the presentation, treatment, and screening for prostate cancer, focusing how these concepts may appear in a clinical vignette. There are three ways prostate cancer can come to the attention of the patient and the physician. The presenting symptoms a patient may notice himself are related to the mass causing obstruction of urine. Men may complain of a feeling of incomplete emptying, frequency, hesitancy, weak stream, or nocturia. However, it's important to realize that benign prostatic hypertrophy has the exact same symptoms, so they're by no means specific to prostate cancer. Now, unfortunately, the mass typically has to get pretty big in order for it to cause obstructive symptoms, and prostate cancer carries a worse prognosis when there's a larger tumor burden. If the cancer is even more advanced, such as in stage 4, where it's metastasized outside the prostate gland, the patient can sometimes present with bone pain or symptoms of hypercalcemia due to metastasis to the bone. Now, the vast majority of patients with prostate cancer are asymptomatic at diagnosis, so the patients get diagnosed either by the physician palpating a mass on digital rectal exam or noticing an elevated or rising prostate-specific antigen, or PSA. It's important to remember, though, that no matter what raises the suspicion for prostate cancer, the only way to make the definitive diagnosis is to perform a biopsy. As with the diagnosis of all cancers, the most accurate test for prostate cancer is biopsy. A prostate biopsy is typically performed by passing a small needle through the rectum, usually under the guidance of ultrasound. But in some cases, the biopsy needle can be passed either transurethrally or through the perineum. Prostate cancer in general is described as a very indolent cancer, 
that means it grows very slowly. We know that because examination of prostates of men on autopsy specimens have shown that more than half of all men older than 80 have prostate cancer. The majority of these men never even knew they had cancer, and that's because it grew so slowly that they lived their lives and ended up dying of something else before it ever caused them symptoms. This indolent natural history of prostate cancer is an important thing to keep in mind when deciding whether or not to put an older man with early stage prostate cancer through aggressive treatment. Once prostate cancer is diagnosed, there are five main treatment options available. A surgery to remove the whole prostate, called a prostatectomy, is one option to treat prostate cancer that is not yet spread beyond the prostate itself. Radiation therapy is another option where radiation is directed at the prostate from an external source. Brachytherapy is another flavor of radiation where radioactive implants, or seeds, are actually placed within the prostate to treat it from the inside out. Hormonal therapy is geared towards blocking the effects of testosterone on the prostate cancer. It doesn't cure prostate cancer by itself, but it can add benefit to either surgery or radiation in certain circumstances, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Something they call watchful waiting is another option, especially given what we just talked about concerning the slow-growing, indolent nature of most prostate cancers. Depending on the age, health status, and personal preferences of the patient, sometimes watching the cancer with parameters such as PSA, physical exam, and imaging can be a reasonable approach. On the USMLE Step 2, they will not ask you which of the treatment options is best, because for localized prostate cancer, the literature is mixed. However, you should be familiar with the side effects and how they differ among these treatment options. It's controversial, but there are some studies that suggest prostatectomy may have a slight benefit over radiation therapy in terms of overall survival. However, there are some significant complications associated with prostatectomy, including erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence, that patients have to keep in mind when choosing treatment. It's well established that the side effects of erectile dysfunction and incontinence are much more common after prostatectomy than after radiation therapy. So we've said a biopsy is of the utmost importance in making the diagnosis of prostate cancer. So what do we look for when we examine a prostate biopsy? The Gleason score is a number from 2 to 10 that describes the histologic grade of the tumor. A higher Gleason score means the cancer looks less like the normal prostate with small unified glands and more like a de-differentiated anaplastic tumor. A Gleason score is obtained by a pathologist looking at the biopsy specimen under the microscope and the oncologist or urologist uses the Gleason score to help estimate prognosis and choose treatment. Studies suggest that a high Gleason score means a patient may derive more benefit from prostatectomy rather than radiation or one of the other first-line treatment options. As we mentioned before, hormone therapy is one treatment option for prostate cancer. Typically, it's not a curative treatment, but rather helps control the size and progression of metastasis once they've occurred. Hormone therapy is different between prostate and breast cancer in that tamoxifen, remember, helps to prevent breast cancer recurrence, whereas hormone therapy for prostate cancer simply shrinks recurrence or metastasis that have already occurred. Flutamide is one option for hormonal therapy, and it works by blocking the action of testosterone and DHT on prostate cancer cells, and it does that by acting as a competitive antagonist. Luprolide and gosrolin are GnRH agonists. They first act to actually stimulate a burst of LH and FSH release from the anterior pituitary, but then eventually they downregulate LH and FSH, which leads to an overall decrease in production of endoscopy endogenous testosterone. Ketoconazole is actually an antifungal medication, but it also acts to suppress testosterone production. And finally, orchiectomy stops endogenous production of testosterone by the testes altogether with surgical removal. We've discussed on prior slides some of the beneficial treatments for patients with prostate cancer. As with most cancer therapies, it's not clear exactly which treatment modality is clearly superior. It's often left up to the patient and the individual characteristics of that patient's cancer stage, grade, and other medical problems as to which treatment they decide to undergo. 
With so much controversy, it's important not to get too wrapped up in the details and to focus on the clear-cut points that are not up for debate, and therefore are much more likely to be tested on your USMLE Step 2. Here are some statements that are incorrect and will never be the right answer when asked about the treatment of a patient with prostate cancer. First, screening for prostate cancer is controversial enough, but using imaging like prostate ultrasound or pelvic CT scan is never indicated for prostate cancer screening. Prostate ultrasound is not a screening test. What it's used for is to localize lesions to biopsy when the prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, is found to be high or rising. Partial surgeries analogous to the lumpectomy for breast cancer are also never the right answer. With prostate cancer, you either remove the whole prostate or nothing at all. Chemotherapy has not been shown to be beneficial in curing prostate cancer. What it's used for is a treatment of last resort to control metastatic disease that has failed either local therapy or hormonal therapy. Also remember, we've said this before, the key difference between hormonal therapy for breast cancer and prostate cancer is that in breast cancer, tamoxifen or other estrogen antagonists have been shown to prevent the recurrence of disease and even to prevent disease in the first place if there's a strong family history. In prostate cancer, antiandrogen medications simply shrink disease that is already present. Prostate-specific antigen screening is another controversial subject. When to start, how often to screen, and who needs screening in the first place are all up for debate, and different organizations such as the American Neurologic Society and the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force have differing opinions as to whether or not it should be done in the first place. Here are the key facts to know. Although PSA screening may detect prostate cancer earlier, it has never been shown that regular PSA screening reduces the mortality associated with prostate cancer. Therefore, it should not be routinely offered to all men. It's important to keep in mind that a normal PSA definitely does not exclude the possibility of prostate cancer, and a high PSA can be caused by conditions other than prostate cancer, most notably BPH or prostatitis. However, if prostate cancer is known to be present after being diagnosed by biopsy, we do know that the higher the PSA, the larger the volume of cancer that's likely to be present in the body. PSA is also a valuable tumor marker to survey for the recurrence of prostate cancer after prostatectomy or radiation therapy. Even though PSA screening isn't indicated for all men, the medical community does agree that PSA screening should be discussed between the patient and his doctor on a case-by-case -case basis. People with a strong family history or other risk factors for prostate cancer may benefit from screening. Therefore, on the USMLE Step 2, if you're faced with a question stem that mentions a patient is requesting a PSA test, the correct answer is to order that test for the patient. As we finish up this section, let's talk about what to do once you get the results of that PSA test you ordered. This algorithm is also without controversy. If the PSA test is found to be high, and high is defined as a number greater than 4 nanograms per deciliter, the next best step is to perform a digital rectal exam. If there's a palpable mass or nodule, the next best step is to biopsy that mass and to send it for pathologic examination. By doing this, we want to determine the presence of cancer, and if cancer is present, we want to know what the Gleason score is. If there is no mass or nodule appreciated on a digital rectal exam, the next step would then be to perform a transrectal ultrasound. Ultrasound can sometimes detect a nodule that's too small or in a location that cannot be palpated. So if a mass is seen on ultrasound, it should be biopsied. But if no mass is appreciated, then multiple blind biopsies should be done by both sides of the prostate in as many areas as possible. This concludes our section on prostate cancer. There isn't much that the USMLE Step 2 test makers expect you to know regarding the management of patients with lung cancer. And that's because lung cancers are typically and unfortunately diagnosed pretty late and are treated palliatively, that is without curative intent, using chemo, radiation, molecular therapies, or some combination of the three. However, there are a few key details you need to know, so in the next couple slides we'll hit those highlights of what you might actually be tested on. 
When faced with a patient either in a clinical vignette on step two or in real life who has lung cancer, the most important question to ask yourself first and foremost is, can this patient be treated with surgery? This question is vital because if a lung cancer is caught early enough, and more accurately, if a lung cancer is caught when it is small enough, it can sometimes be completely resected with surgery and give that patient their best shot at a cure. What you need to know for step two is the most important factor determining resectability is the size of the tumor. Now, if the tumor is larger, but the patient has otherwise healthy lungs and their lung function is good enough for the patient to ventilate adequately after a larger resection, some surgeons will still consider surgery. However, preoperative pulmonary function tests are part of the workup to determine whether or not this will be possible on a case-by-case -case basis. If a lung cancer is deemed resectable, there are three surgeries that can be done to remove a lung mass, and these vary based on the amount of lung tissue that's removed. The first is a wedge resection, and this is performed when the lesion is very small. Second, a lobectomy can be performed, and this is a surgery where the affected area of lung tissue is removed. Usually it's done when the lesion is bigger, or it has more infiltration into a specific section of the lung. Third and most extensively, a surgery to remove the entire affected lung can be performed. This surgery is typically only done in young patients or patients with otherwise healthy lungs. Unfortunately, the majority of patients with lung cancer are smokers and often have emphysema or chronic bronchitis or other lung disease that makes the rest of their lung not healthy enough to compensate for removing such a large amount of lung tissue along with the tumor. For this last slide, we'll talk about the situations in which surgery is never an option, at least as far as a correct answer on the USMLE Step 2 is concerned. First, when there are cancerous lung masses in both lungs, surgery is never appropriate. Second, Anytime you have a malignant pleural effusion accompanying a lung mass, surgery is not a curative treatment either. And remember from the pulmonary section that a malignant effusion is typically exudative by Light's criteria. Third, anytime there are other thoracic organs involved, such as the heart, carina, aorta, or vena cava, a surgical resection of a lung cancer is not an appropriate, appropriate treatment because it's not feasible to remove parts of these other organs as well. Finally, if on biopsy the lung cancer is found to be small cell in origin, it's nearly always considered unresectable. And this is because in greater than 95% of cases, small cell carcinoma is metastatic on diagnosis, often going to the brain or adrenal glands. And this concludes our section on lung cancer. Though the gynecology section of USMLE's Step 2 review discusses the gynecologic malignancies in more detail, we'll review the highlights regarding screening, diagnosis, and treatment of ovarian cancer in the next couple slides. It's important to remember that in contrast to breast and cervical cancer, there is no effective screening test for ovarian cancer, so it's often not caught until it's very late in the progression of disease. How a USMLE Step 2 clinical vignette will describe a patient with ovarian cancer is by telling you there's a woman who's greater than the age of 50 with increasing abdominal girth uh, and possibly other constitutional symptoms such as fatigue and weight loss. They will often also tell you that the patient has no history of drinking alcohol or being diagnosed with hepatitis or other liver disease to help you distinguish increased abdominal girth from ascites versus the collection of abnormal fluid due to ovarian cancer. There are several established risk factors for ovarian cancer that you should know for your test. These include the BRCA1 and 2 mutations that we talked about in reference to breast cancer, as well as using estrogen replacement therapy. Some protective factors, including having a greater number of children or using hormonal contraception. Both of these things actually reduce the risk of ovarian cancer. When a clinical scenario suggests that ovarian cancer is the diagnosis, 
The best initial test to confirm that is to either order an ultrasound transabdominally or transvaginally or to order an abdominal CT scan. Both of these will show both the mass as well as the accumulation of abnormal fluid within the peritoneal cavity. Like with all cancers, the most accurate diagnostic test for ovarian cancer is a biopsy. This gives you a piece of tissue to look at under the microscope and not only confirm that cancer is present, but to make the diagnosis of what type of ovarian cancer the patient has. The vast majority of ovarian cancers are adenocarcinomas, and these arise from the lining of the ovary itself, but there are more rare forms of ovarian cancer that include the germ cell tumors. The treatment for ovarian cancer typically consists of surgery followed by chemotherapy. And there's one important thing to keep in mind regarding the treatment of ovarian cancer. It's one of the few times where we do a surgery even in patients who have widespread metastatic disease. That's not usually the case for most other forms of cancer. The surgery for ovarian cancer is pretty extensive. You basically cut out as much as you need to to remove all of the visible tumor. If the tumor is small and only present on one ovary, you can get away with just removing the ovary on that side in addition to the fallopian tube. But in bigger tumors or more widespread disease, the surgeries can be as extensive as removing all of the pelvic organs, including the uterus, both ovaries and fallopian tubes, as well as the bladder in some cases. Now the prognosis, even after all of this, for patients with ovarian cancer is pretty poor. And that's because ovarian cancer is diagnosed so late in stage. Over half of women are already at stage three or four when they're diagnosed, and because of that, only about 50% of women diagnosed with ovarian cancer will be alive in five years. This concludes our discussion of ovarian cancer. In contrast to ovarian cancer, testicular cancers are often detected at an earlier stage because the symptoms are more easily noticed by the patient and the cancer is in a more easily accessible location by physical exam. In this section, we'll discuss the presentation, diagnosis, and treatment of testicular cancer. Testicular cancer is generally a disease of younger men. The peak age of diagnosis is anywhere between 20 to 40 years old. The classic presentation of testicular cancer is the patient himself noticing a painless lump in his scrotum. And unlike ovarian cancer, most testicular cancers are diagnosed early because the area in question is so much more easily accessible to physical exam. So if you're presented with a patient who has a painless lump that they noticed themselves or that the physician noticed on physical exam, what is the next best step in making the diagnosis? Well, the correct answer is either going to be to perform transillumination, which is where you shine a light through the mass to see if it is solid or if it is cystic, transmitting light, or to perform a scrotal ultrasound. And scrotal ultrasound gives you the same information. It tells you whether the mass is solid, in which case it would be more concerning for cancer, or whether it's cystic. And cystic masses uh, typically will mean that the diagnosis is one of the others on the differential. So what other diagnoses can be confused with testicular cancer? The most common ones are infectious, something like epididymitis or an infection from either a UTI or an STD, a hematocele or a varicocele. And again, you can tell these three apart from testicular cancer because they will have positive transillumination, light will transmit through these masses, and they will be cystic on scrotal ultrasound. So once you've recognized the classic presentation and you've performed your initial tests to confirm your suspicions that this mass is indeed cancerous, what do you do to confirm the diagnosis? Well, like with most cancers, you want tissue to examine under the microscope. So the difference between testicular cancer and other cancers is you don't want to do a biopsy of a testicular mass. 
Anytime you see a solid mass on ultrasound or it doesn't illuminate light on transillumination, what you want to do is to remove the whole testicle in question. The approach to this is called an inguinal orchiectomy. It's important not to cut the scrotum during this excision because it can spread disease and seed unaffected skin and soft tissue with cancer cells. For the same reason, you will never do a needle biopsy on a suspected testicular mass. You know, the same thing can happen. If you stick a needle into an area that contains cancer cells, as you retract the needle, you're going to seed cancer cells all along the route that the needle's taking. There are certain tumor markers that can be helpful in the diagnosis and prognosis of different testicular germ cell tumors. Diagnosis is best made by examination of the cancer cells under the microscope and identifying the cell of origin. However, these tumor markers can help with prognosis, higher is typically worse, and with detecting recurrence after surgery and or chemotherapy. Some medical oncologists follow these tumor markers after each cycle of chemo to monitor response to therapy and to decide whether or not to continue or change agents. Seminomas have a normal alpha fetoprotein, but can have an elevated beta HCG. LDH is not specific to seminoma, but it can correlate with extent of disease burden. Non-seminomas have different tumor markers depending on type. Yolk sac tumors, also known as endodermal sinus tumors, have elevated alpha fetoprotein but normal beta HCG. Embryonal, choriocarcinoma, and teratomas can all have both alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG levels elevated. Once the diagnosis of testicular cancer has been made and the tissue has been looked at under the microscope by a pathologist and the exact histologic type of cancer has been determined, the next best step is to perform a staging workup. The best staging exam for testicular cancer is a CT scan that includes the abdomen, pelvis, and chest. And this is because lymphatic channels in the retroperitoneum are the first place that testicular cancer spreads. And those channels lead right up into the chest and mediastinum and can allow the testicular cancer to spread rather quickly. Here we have a CT scan in which you can see a large mass in the retroperitoneum that actually encases the abdominal aorta. This is a classic pattern of spread for testicular cancer. The treatment of testicular cancer is largely surgical. Remember that once a testicular mass is concerning for testicular cancer, the next best step is to perform an orchiectomy. So in that case, an orchiectomy is actually both diagnostic and therapeutic, because remember, a biopsy is never appropriate in a testicular mass concerning for cancer. Now once the testicular mass is taken out, examined by a pathologist, and the type of cancer is determined by looking at the tissue under the microscope, the patient may or may not need radiation as part of their regimen to treat any local disease left behind at the tumor bed. Chemotherapy is often included in the regimen as well because it acts systemically to treat any disease that's spread throughout the body through lymph the lymphatics to other sites. It's important to remember that in contrast to ovarian cancer, testicular cancer actually has a pretty good prognosis and that's because the site of disease is easily accessible to palpation by the patient himself and to healthcare providers, so it's usually diagnosed pretty early. Three quarters of men have local disease at diagnosis, and that means that there's actually a 90% cure rate when the disease is caught early. And even if it's not, testicular cancer is actually one of the only cancers in which chemotherapy can actually cure widespread metastatic disease. So even a man who has lung or even brain metastasis at diagnosis can be cured with chemotherapy. And this concludes our section on testicular cancer. In this section, we'll cover the prevention and early detection of cervical cancer, its clinical presentation, and treatment. Although the oncologic community has made great progress in the last few decades in the treatment of cancer, our 
biggest gains in preventing death from cancer has actually been in either preventing cancer from arising in the first place by identifying major risk factors or in performing effective screening to catch cancer when it's at an early, non-invasive, and more easily treatable stage. Now there's no better example of this than cervical cancer. The more we understand about cervical cancer, the better we realize that almost all cases are associated with an infection with the human papillomavirus. Particularly, serotypes 16 and 18 are very likely to cause cervical cancer. Therefore, in the last few years, there's been a lot of attention in developing and promoting a vaccine against the human papillomavirus. It's recommended that this vaccine be given to all women between ages 11 and 26, and the vaccination of men is in discussion now as well. All the vaccines against human papillomavirus include serotypes 16 and 18 because they're most commonly associated with cervical cancer. Some vaccines also include the serotypes 6 and 11, which are more associated with genital warts. Now aside from prevention, early detection is the other cornerstone in preventing death from cancer, and cervical cancer is no exception. The rate of death from cervical cancer has declined sharply since the routine initiation of pap smear screening. There have been a lot of back and forth and changes of opinion in when pap smear screening should start and how often it should happen, but the most current guidelines, the most current recommendations, which are what you'll be tested on on the USMLE Step 2, include the initiation of pap smear screening starting for women at age 21. Now that's regardless of sexual activity. The frequency is recommended to be every two to three years until the woman reaches the age of 65 or has a hysterectomy without evidence or history of prior cancer. The results of a pap smear can range from totally normal cervical cells all the way to frank cancer. In the middle of the spectrum include different degrees of dysplasia or abnormality in the cervical cells themselves. The most common abnormal pap is a finding called atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, or ASCUS for short. So what happens when a woman has ASCUS on her pap? Well, the next best step is to perform HPV testing. If the ASCUS is HPV positive, the next step is to send the woman for a colposcopy and to perform a cervical biopsy to get more cells in order to get more information on whether or not a pre-invasive form of cervical cancer is present. If the ASCUS is HPV negative, the woman can go ahead and come back for a repeat pap smear in six months to make sure that the ASCUS has resolved or hasn't progressed into a more high-grade dysplasia. In addition to ASCUS, Further along the spectrum of cervical dysplasia include low-grade and high-grade dysplasia. If these findings are found on pap smear, the woman is sent directly for colposcopy and biopsy of the lesion. Now it's important to remember that the finding of ASCUS doesn't necessarily mean the woman has cancer or definitely will develop cancer. It can simply be a false positive, and the younger a woman is, the more likely it is that the ASCUS is a false positive. It's also important to remember that although the pap smear has decreased the deaths from cervical cancer and helps detect it early, all in all, it does not lower mortality as much as other screening tests such as mammography or colonoscopy. Most cases of cervical cancer are detected when the woman is asymptomatic based on her abnormal PAP results, as we discussed previously. If the woman is symptomatic from her cervical cancer, the common presenting symptoms are most likely to be abnormal vaginal bleeding. The hallmark, or the key words to note in a clinical vignette, are postcoital bleeding, or bleeding after sexual intercourse. Other symptoms from cervical cancer can include abnormal vaginal discharge, a dull pelvic pain or a sensation of fullness in the pelvis, as well as dysuria. If cervical cancer is caught early before it's spread beyond the pelvis, the treatment of choice is hysterectomy. 
Here we see the surgical cuts made in the removal of the pelvic organs. A hysterectomy removes not only the uterus, but also the parametrial tissues that flank the cervix, as well as the upper portion of the vagina. If cervical cancer is diagnosed at a more advanced stage, where it's spread to the lymph nodes or other areas in the pelvis, surgery isn't enough. Radiation, with or without the addition of chemotherapy, gives the patient her best chance of cure in more advanced cases. In cases of widely metastatic disease, where a disease is spread beyond the pelvis, unfortunately a cure is not possible, but chemotherapy and radiation therapy can be given to control the symptoms of the cervical cancer and to improve the patient's quality of life. And this concludes our section on cervical cancer.